Hi, my name's Dave Bookless, and this talk is called Being Church in the Real World. And I've got a kind of subtitle for this talk as well, which is, are we building churches or are we building for God's kingdom? Are we building churches or are we building for God's kingdom? What's your vision for the church? Is your vision for more members, for revival, in terms of numbers and people coming to church and filling up the church? Is your vision for more churches? For church growth, for church planting, for fresh expressions of church? Is your vision for churches to be transformed, to becoming whole life disciples in our churches? Or do you have a bigger vision? After all, Jesus didn't talk that much about church. The rest of the New Testament does, but Jesus talked far more about the kingdom. And the illustrations that Jesus used when he was talking about the kingdom of God are ones that's worth us thinking about for a moment, because they're all about something quite small that transforms everything that's around it. So yeast, yeast that can transform the dough of unbaked bread and make it into a wonderful warm fresh loaf. Salt, salt that is tiny but that can transform food into a delicious meal. Light, light that can be quite small and could be hidden away but is best when it's not hidden but shines out from on top of a hill. Something small that brings light, that transforms what's around it. And finally, a mustard seed, something absolutely tiny, but that grows and grows and grows until it's big enough not only to provide good things, but also to be a home for lots of other creatures as well. All those illustrations have two things in common. Firstly, of course, they're taken from nature as so much of Jesus's teaching was. They're taken from the creation that he made and that he sustains. But secondly, those illustrations are not so much about church, but they're what the disciples, the church, do for the world around. They're about the transformation that we bring. To use the language of church, they're about church as an agent of transformation for the world. And that's the vision of the kingdom. I don't know if you've had one of those, ex those experiences when reading the Bible, perhaps when reading a familiar passage, when suddenly it's come clear in a new way and it's been a profoundly exciting moment. Well, I had that some years ago when I was reading Romans chapter eight, which is a very familiar passage. And when I read this verse and started to understand it, it made the hairs on the back of my neck absolutely stand up. And yes, I did actually have hairs on the back of my neck back then. Romans 8 verse 19, it says this, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Creation is waiting for the church. That's who the children of God are. Creation is waiting for the children of God to be revealed. Tom Wright in his book, Surprised by Hope, puts it like this. The whole creation is waiting in eager longing, not just for its own redemption, its liberation from corruption and decay, but for God's children to be revealed. In other words, for the unveiling of those redeemed humans through whose stewardship creation will at last be brought back into that wise order for which it was made. That's an amazing claim that that passage is making. It's quite mind-blowing. God is saying the church, and it, most of our churches are far from perfect, as we know only too well. But God is saying creation is waiting for the church. Now, over the last 50 years that we've become aware that we're in the midst of an environmental crisis, many environmentalists have pointed to the church and said, you're the heart of the problem. There was a famous essay written more than 50 years ago by an American historian called Lynn White Jr. that argued 
that Christianity is responsible for the ecological crisis because Christianity teaches that humans are made in the image of God and therefore put someone on a pedestal above nature so that we can exploit and destroy nature as we wish. Now, it's pretty poor theology that Lynn White Jr. had, but actually, sadly, he has a point. Sometimes Christians have preached that being made in the image of God means we can do what we like with the rest of God's creation. But it's a tragic misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Romans 8 is making the audacious claim that what creation needs is the church. And to understand this passage better, in a sense, we need to go back to Genesis 1, where God first makes human beings, male and female, in God's image. And then he gives us a commission. He gives us a job description. And to paraphrase it, he says, go and look after my world. That's what it means to have dominion over the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. It doesn't mean to dominate and to destroy and to exploit because God has made these creatures very good. He's made them in love. To reflect God's image means to reflect that love, to reflect God's character towards the rest of creation. It's our first job description. And tragically, we failed from the beginning onwards. From Adam and Eve onwards, we failed to care for creation. And what is now being claimed by St Paul in this passage in Romans 8 is that now human beings who are redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit can take up that job description once again. That in the power of the Spirit, we can fulfil that first great commission, our first great vocation to care for God's creation on his behalf. Romans 8 carries on a couple of verses later and says this, creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And commenting on that, Tom Wright says, God will redeem the whole universe. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of that new life, the fresh grass growing through the concrete of corruption and decay in our old world. This world is not destined for destruction. This world is destined for renewal because of Jesus. There is hope for the whole of creation. God will redeem the whole universe, set it free from its bondage to decay. And where does that leave us as the church? Well, we don't exist for our own sake, simply to plant more churches and recruit more members. The church exists for the world, to be salt and light and yeast, to be a transforming presence. As the church, we should be for all of life, to bring life and light to the whole of God's creation. Because God's plans are bigger than the church, but the church is an important agent within them. The kingdom of God is God's rule over every part of society all of life, as we've seen. The German theologian Jürgen Moltmann says this, it was a modern and dangerous contraction when the church came to be narrowed down to the human world. But if the church is cosmos orientated, then the ecological crisis of the earthly creation is the church's own crisis. For through this destruction of the earth, even the church is destroyed. When the weaker creatures die, the whole community of creation suffers. They're quite profound words, but at the heart of them is this vision that our calling as the church is to be there for the whole of creation, to be cosmos orientated. Why? Because Jesus is Lord of creation and the church is to be the body of Christ. Ephesians 1 says, God placed all things under his feet, Jesus' feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Those two uses of everything are about the whole of creation. 
And similarly in Colossians chapter 1, in a passage where it talks about Jesus as the source of creation, the sustainer of creation and the saviour of creation, it also reminds us that Christ is the head of the body, the church, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. God's work through his body, the church, the body of Christ, is linked to the transformation of the whole of creation. Now, what makes our vision of the good life and our vision of transformation for this creation different from secular visions that there are or visions from other faiths? Well, there is some overlap because God has planted within all human beings clear desires about what is good and what is best. But I want to suggest three ways in which a Christian understanding, a biblical understanding is distinctive. First of all, our model of the good life. Our model is the kingdom of God, of shalom and restored relationships. At the heart of God himself is relationship, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And the whole of creation is an overflow of that love that exists at the heart of God that brought creation into being. Our vision is of a time when one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess, not just in human terms, but in heaven and on earth and under the earth, the whole of creation confess that Jesus is Lord. Our model is one where justice and righteousness and joy can flourish. Let me tell you of a biblical example and a couple of practical stories that, in, that illustrate our model. The biblical, biblical example is Noah's Ark. In Noah's Ark, we see God's plans of salvation. And who gets saved? Well, yes, human beings, but actually an awful lot of other creatures too. In fact, representatives of every living creature on the earth. And that gives us a clue that God's plans are for all, that there is room for all. Our model doesn't discriminate and say it's either caring for people or caring for wildlife. It includes both. And in our work in Arusha, we see that in practical ways. Let me give you two examples. In Kenya, we have a project on the Kenyan coast north of Mombasa, an area where there's a large forest, the Arabuko Sokoke forest, that was threatened by deforestation and bushmeat hunting from the local communities living around the forest. And they were poor communities. So what do you do? Do you say that we care for people and their welfare matters? Or do you say we care for wildlife? There are rare species found nowhere else on earth in that forest. Well, in our Russia, our answer was we care for both because both were put on the ark. Because our model is one where human beings and other creatures should flourish together. And so we set up an environmental education program. And we set up a scheme whereby ecotourism in the forest now provides incomes for the families who live around the forest. And instead of destroying the forest for their livelihoods, it's now caring for the forest that provides their livelihoods. Similarly, in India, near the, the mega city of Bangalore, Arusha is helping protect uh, the Banagata National Park an area of forest with elephants and leopards and even tigers that was being threatened by the growth of the city. And Arusha isn't simply saying we should protect the wildlife and not care about the people, or the other way around. It's both. Our model is a model that has this big vision of humanity and the rest of creation thriving together. So our model is distinctive. And secondly, our motivation is distinctive. There are lots of good motives for caring for creation. We can care for creation because the poor suffer most when it's damaged. They are the primary victims of climate change and deforestation and extreme weather events. We can care for creation because future generations are going to be deprived of seeing wonderful wildlife and perhaps even of being able to live in a healthy way because of the damage we're doing to the environment. We can care for creation because we love other species. We love wildlife and all of those are good reasons. But for us as Christians, 
our primary reason for caring for creation is not because of the poor or future generations or other species. It's because of Jesus. It's because this is his world and he commands us to care for it. He calls us to care for creation. And that means that creation care is different from secular environmentalism. There's no risk that we're going to worship the planet because we're worshipping Jesus through caring for the planet. And we shouldn't think that other species are more, more important than humans because we're worshipping Jesus. In our experience in Arusha and in some of what I've seen in local churches, we can really put that into practice. When we put Jesus at the heart of our care for creation, it means that we don't ignore the needs of the people who are there as well because we see the face of Jesus in them and we want to care for them too. So our motivation is different, our model is different, and thirdly, our methods can also be different because we care for creation in the power of the Spirit. In Romans 8, the word groaning is used three times. It talks about creation groans as it waits to be set free from its bondage to despair. It talks about how we as God's people groan as we long for things to be different. And it talks about God's Holy Spirit groaning as we pray with groans too deep for words. The Holy Spirit works through us. Our method in caring for creation is to do this in the power of the Spirit because without that we're bound to fail. Our weakness and our frailty will make it impossible. But with the Spirit's renewing work, we have hope. And today, we're beginning to see around the world the early signs of God's church caring for creation in astonishing and exciting ways. Let me give you a couple of examples to close with. So one example is Eco Church. Here in the UK, Eco Church was launched just over three years ago by Arosha along with other organisations. And in three years, we've seen more than two and a half thousand churches sign up to become eco churches. Following an online program where they do an audit of their current environmental impact and then to seek to make changes. Looking at everything from preaching and teaching and worship songs and Sunday school materials through to how they heat and light their building, where their consumables come from and also looking at the lifestyle of church members and at how they can work to make the local environment around their church a better place. And we're seeing real tangible differences as people do that. And I know of a number of stories where churches have seen people come to faith as they've started to care for creation. One of my good friends who worked very closely with us in the early days of Arosha used to say, when Christians take the earth seriously, people take the gospel seriously. And that's exactly what we're finding. People make these links when we realise that the gospel is about all of life, all of God's creation. And they realise that actually that applies to them too and they want to be involved. And another example I can give is a more global one. Over the last eight or ten years, I've been involved with a network of Christians around the world trying to get uh, regional and national groups to care for creation and we've had over 10 regional conferences in different parts of the world which have brought together Christian leaders from within that region to look at God's world, the environmental problems, God's word, what the Bible has to teach and God's work, how we can respond in practical ways and through that we now have a network of about 1,500 Christian leaders from more than 100 countries around the world who are encouraging each other and are on a journey of caring for creation. I believe in the coming years we're going to see some amazing stories as God's church begins to get active again in caring for creation and as creation recognises that the people of God are doing what God has always wanted them to do. Let's hope that we together can be part of that journey.